Hi, my name is Melanie Espinosa. I'm from Dominican Republic. And yeah, I want to go to pray in Spanish for you. Amantísimo Dios que estás en los cielos. Gracias, Señor, por este día más que tú tienes aquí en tu presencia. Gracias, Señor, por cada una de estas personas que están aquí presentes. Señor, para que tengan una visión cada día más. En la mañana, en la tarde, en la noche, en cada uno de esos momentos. Señor, para que tome el dominio y el control de esa actividad. Y que tú puedas dejar más tu Espíritu Santo sobre cada uno de nosotros. Gracias, Señor. En el nombre de Dios, Jesús. Amén. Amén. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed.
remarked to a preacher in a mocking fashion. You say that unsaved people carry a great weight of sin. Frankly, I feel nothing. How heavy is sin? 10 pounds, 50 pounds, 80 pounds, 100 pounds? <laughs> the preacher thought for a moment, then replied, if you weighed a 400 pound weight on a corpse, would it feel the loop? The young man was quick to say, of course not, it's dead. Driving home his point, the preacher said, the person who doesn't know Christ is equally dead. And though the wound is great, he feels none of it. Sin is a heavy weight to carry. How heavy is the weight you've been carrying? Is it 10 pounds? 50 pounds? 80 pounds? Is it 100 pounds? Do you even feel the weight of your sin? Or do you fail to realize the load that is on your shoulders? Do other people see you struggling with this heavy weight? Or are you struggling to keep your weight a secret? I'm going to quote an article I recently read, and it says this. The Christian, unlike the average non-Christian, is not indifferent to the weight of sin. He is actually hypersensitive to it. Having come to Jesus, his senses are awakened to the reality of sin. His sensitivity to sin intensifies as he matures spiritually. Such sensitivity prompted a saint as great as Chrysostom, the 4th century church father, to say, he feared nothing but sin. Romans 7, 14 through 20 says, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer myself who do it, but it is the sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not know the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. What is sin? According to Google definitions, sin is an immoral act considered to be a transgression against divine law. That is, anything that separates us from God. Sin is anything that separates us from God. So what qualifies as sin? First, let us talk about the ways that others may be able to see us struggling with, or what we call our open sin. An open sin, as defined by me, is when we live openly in our sin and either have not yet reached a point in spiritual maturity where we are physically or emotionally able to hand our sin over to Christ, or we embrace our sin and allow it to define us. I just read to you a scripture where we claim that we are not born good. We are literally born into sin. Therefore, we have the choice to either run from it and yeah, either run from what scripture and moral values tells us is wrong, that is, flee temptation, or we can jump headfirst into the pool of sin we are born into and allow ourselves to become our sin. To give you a short list of the common open sins our society is most highlighting right now would include lying, theft, sorry, lying, theft, gambling, addictions, pornography, and immoral sexuality. Before I go further, I want to be very clear that the Bible states to hate the sin, not the sinner. Amen. So that we are very clear on what this means, I'll compare it to the love a parent has for their child. Just as God is our father, we are his children. If you are a mother or a father and your child has ever wronged you, embarrassed you in public, failed to obey you, etc., you are naturally upset and dislike their actions, correct? But no matter what they have done, no matter how bad, it has never changed your love for them. Amen. No matter what they do, good or bad, your love for them will never fail. The same is true of God, and the same should be true if you claim to be a Christian. Okay, now that we're clear on this, I want to emphasize on sexual immorality. Most of us hear sexual immorality, and we believe that it's only having sex outside of marriage, but it's so much more than this. Sexual immorality is the only sin listed in scripture that is committed inside of the body, where the Holy Spirit dwells. That makes it an inward sin, and an offense committed directly to the Holy Spirit itself. In 
light of recent news and debate, I want to inform you that homosexuality, as listed in scripture, is also an act of sexual immorality. In case you're confused about this, last time I checked, whether God said something six times or 60 times, his word is still his word. Yep. All right, so in case you guys weren't aware, and despite his complaining this morning, arguing and asking, why do I have to be here? To which I replied, because you turned 54 this month and you're the pastor. My father's here. So I have the absolute best father in the world. No offense, guys, but I do. And I respect him greatly. But I know that whether my dad tells me something one time, that he should not. Even if he does tell me a hundred times, those times when he tells me once are still just as heard and honored as the times he tells me repeatedly. You are not your sin. You understand that? Do not allow yourself to be defined by the mistakes you make or the sin you were born into. Do not label yourself or claim the sin that you are struggling with. We serve a merciful and gracious Father who sent His Son to bleed and die for you so that you would claim victory over your sin and no longer be defined by what or who Satan tells you that you are. Now I want to talk a little bit about the way that we're struggling to hide from others, the way that we do our best to bear alone. I call this our secret sin, or as again, defined by me, the sin that we are ashamed to admit that we are struggling with, but know that we need to get rid of it. We are hypersensitive to it, and want to be able to hand that sin over to Christ, but we are terrified of the consequences or what people may think of us. A short list of these sins may include lying, lustfulness, hate, pride, resentment, jealousy, and so many more. We may believe that because no one knows about our sin that it does not affect them and we cannot hurt them, but there has never been a more untrue statement. God did not create us as ignorant beings. That means that while we may think that we are doing a good job hiding our sins, people can see our actions, and our actions show our hearts. Proverbs, Proverbs 28, 13 states, He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. I urge you to find an accountability partner. I recommend someone of the same gender, close to the, your same age, and who can speak objectively and unbiased into your life. I met mine on flight home from Costa Rica this year. I was extremely ill and I was terrible at hiding it, but I tried. Um, we started small talk, small talk, and it, as we were getting off the plane, she asked if she could pray for me. We swapped email addresses and have stayed in constant communication since. The only communication we hold is through snail mail or email. I don't know her Facebook, her Instagram, her Twitter. I don't even know her telephone number or any other means of communication or ways to form opinions about each other. It's strictly, strictly accountability. Okay. If it takes a stranger to hold you accountable, then that's what you need to do. I'm not saying that everyone needs to have the same relationship with their accountability partner as I do. I'm only saying that we are not meant to carry the weight of our sin alone. God places people into our lives for a reason, and we are called to love, to have love spoken into our lives just as much as we are called to speak love into others' lives. Having fear of our sin and allowing it to define us and control who we are is making ourselves slaves to sin. Dictionary.com defines sin as a person, or defines slave as a person who is the property of and wholly subject to another, a bond servant. Just because we were born into sin does not mean that we have to stay there forever. God created us to be able to make our own decisions, and he gives us a way out. Romans 7, 22 through 25 states, For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner to the law of the spirit at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is called the great exchange. We have sinned freely for so long, adding pounds to the weight that we carry to the point we can no longer carry it on our own. We couldn't get rid of our sin, even if we wanted to. There was no way to become free from our bondage of sin. John 
Constantine is the most well-known Bible verse in the entire world. If you know it, you can say it with me. For God so loved the world that the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Pretty easy, right? We have that memorized. But what about John 3, 17? Honestly, this is my favorite part. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. <clears throat> and that's the great exchange. Jesus willingly gave up all of his glorious riches in heaven and came here to earth, not to be served, but to serve. He lived a perfect and sinless life and willingly went to a cross to buy you out of the captivity of sin. Amen. All you have to do is believe in him and follow him <laughs> to live your life for the one who gave his up for you. One choice, one sacrifice, one love, one great exchange. Jesus paid your debt to your slave owner. You are free if you choose to be. Jesus does not force you to come to him, but he gives you an invitation to enter into his family. Saying yes to him means you are no longer a slave, but have been adopted into sonship by his father. You no longer need to fear the grave but instead can get excited about now, about get excited that we now have full inheritance in God's eternal kingdom. So, this is normally where my dad says, as I conclude my intro, but <laughs> you got blessed today because I'm not my father. Instead, as I conclude today, I want you to think about the drama and the scripture that Seth read to us earlier. Revised, it sounds like this. Jesus gives these Jews both a warning and an invitation. After seeing that they are slaves to sin, he gives the warning. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. He means, as descendants, as descendants of Abraham, you are in God's household. But because of sin, you are in his household as slaves, not as true sons. Slaves don't enjoy the full privileges of sons. Slaves can be expelled from the household at any time, especially if they're not faithful. You're currently enjoying the privileges of God of being in God's household, but you could lose this status if you continue in your sinful ways. Since they have mentioned Abraham, the story of Ishmael, the son of Hagar, the slave, is behind verse 35. When Ishmael wanted Isaac, Abraham was forced to expel him from his household. The Jews who were threatening to kill Jesus were in danger of losing the privileges of being in God's household, but Jesus didn't leave them with only one. Gave them an invitation. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. He's saying, Come to me, I will give you true freedom.